glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Everybody say glory. Just and true are your words, Lord God Almighty. 
Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? You alone are holy, and all nations will come and worship before you. Saints and angels sing. The saints and angels sing. Glory to the Lamb. We sing glory to the Lamb. the kingdom and the power and the glory forever just one more time so. for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You could be seated in the presence of the Lord. Don't we love the word of God, saints? I find myself so often when I'm praying for people who are sick and afflicted, who are needing healing, or who are oppressed or going through trouble, I know that in my words there's not any power. But, oh, whew, there's all power in that word. <laughs> oh, God. You start declaring the word of God, things begin to take place. And, and, and Jesus said, keep them through thy word because it is thy word that is truth. We're living in a generation, saints, like we've never lived before in my recollection. Where so many of God's people are satisfied to live according to the words of men. While we reject the words of God. And the words of God are truth. The words of men, they're a snare. The Bible said that man is snared by the words of his mouth. 
We have to have the word of God, saints. We need the word of God. That word of God rebukes fear. It rebukes doubt. It rebukes worry. It is from everlasting to everlasting. And there's nothing wrong with it. It has no error. Hallelujah. It is power. The Bible said that the, that the gospel to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. There's such power in this word. And that's why I'm telling you, saints of God, in every area of your life, my God, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible said the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And sometimes that standard is just you standing there like Jesus did and declaring it is written. I mean, there's sometimes you just got to tell the devil. That's all right. The word of God says, well, I understand what you're saying, but the word of God says, well, I get where you're coming from, but the word of God says, sometimes you just got to let the enemy know that you're not some ignorant buffoon fumbling around, but you have a word that has power. And, 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 and no matter, I, I could stand to you and I could name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. I could do all these proclamations and declarations there's no power in any of that it's just foolishness but when i stand to preach the word of god anything is possible god can do anything when the word of god is being preached and 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 this is it's so significant saints of god that we understand the times that we live in um, the bible said that the sons of issachar were wise because they were able to discern the times and they were able to tell Israel what they ought to do. And so it is so important for us to know where we are. And I know that every time you turn around, there's a new prediction. I saw a lot of my minister's friends posting about the red heifers, and it's great, wonderful. There's no biblical prophecy really to that at all. It's, it's actually, there's nothing to it, honestly. We're, we're, we, they're making a big thing about really not a whole lot. Yes, the red heifer was used in sacrifice and the cleansing of the instruments of of the tabernacle and they were used and somebody said, well, they're going to reinstitute sacrifice and that's what we're looking for. I'm going to, I'm going to show you by the word of God what we're looking for. So go with me to second Thessalonians two. And I'm going to read this out of the living Bible. And, and what we have to understand about this church in Thessalonica, it was founded by Paul. It was established by Paul and Paul loved this church. But while Paul was there, there arose incredible persecution against him. Uh, in fact, the Bible said that they assaulted the house of Jason. They drug them out trying to get a hold of Paul and his followers. And the persecution was so profound and powerful. Uh, when we read 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, starting at the 13th verse, it, it is what you would consider situational exegesis. Paul's not writing something just to inform. He's writing to deal with the situation that was going on. And the persecution was so profound that people were being put to death. And this death, this, this, this lingering shadow of death was hovering over the church of Thessalonica. And Paul had to comfort them. And he had to give them words of comfort. And so real quickly go there, Xander, 1 Thessalonians 4 and, and verse 13. Praise the Lord. Now, here's what Paul said. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Okay? I don't want you ignorant of what's going on. There's a lot of you that are being put to death. And the families are mourning. But I don't want you to be ignorant of what's happening. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. That's powerful. Because hope, saints of God, is everything to us. I don't, I don't necessarily serve God because I want to feel like a good man. I don't serve God because I have a moral obligation to it. I serve God because I have incredible hope that has been put out before me that I can either take hold of or I can squander. But I have decided that I want to see this hope. For if I would not have you ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not as those which have no hope. 
when, when, when ungodly people die, when the world loses loved ones and they're ungodly and, they, and nobody believes, they're all unbelievers, what torment that has. I, I had to not long ago preach the funeral of a loved one of mine. Understanding that no matter what their past was, their present declared to me that they were not saved. And I had to preach that service having no hope. That is a horrible place to be in. And I couldn't make up the hope because I couldn't deal with the hopelessness. I just had to acknowledge it for what it was. Amen. The better thing is for those that have hope. For those that we know have died in Christ. And the Bible said it's those who hold fast the profession of their faith without wavering faithful unto the end. And he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and how many of us believe that with all of our heart? I do not have any doubt in my mind that Jesus rose again. In fact, the Bible said that he was seen of 500, and for 40 days he went in out among them, showing himself alive with many infallible proofs. 500 at least men, not counting women and children, attested and witnessed to the fact that Jesus Christ ascended back to the Father, that they saw him with their eyes. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's the hope right there. Now Paul's about to flesh this out, not by his words, but by the word of the Lord. This is found in John 5. What Paul's getting ready to say is in John 5. He's not making this up. He didn't just come up with a divine revelation when he was caught up into third heaven. He's speaking concerning the words of Christ. That there will come a day in which all who are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. They which have done good unto the resurrection of life and they which have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And so Paul is not projecting this as something that has taken place, but he's projecting this as something that will indeed take place. He said, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, the word prevent there in the Greek is proceed, them which are asleep. For the Lord, remember what Jesus said in John 5? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. What happens when the trump sounds? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, you have to say, well, well when does this trump take place? Well, Paul deals with this in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, uh, he said we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. You say, when is this last trumpet going to sound? Well, then you have to go to Revelation. I believe it's the 10th or 11th chapter. And the Bible said when the seventh angel sounded, there was great noise in heaven saying the kingdoms of men have become the kingdoms of our Christ and of our God and of our, of our Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. When that last trumpet sounds, what happens? The dead in Christ, the Bible said the dead are raised incorruptible and we are changed. Here in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is dealing with the same subject matter because he's dealing with a church that is in deep mourning because of great losses that are among them. And he said, this is the hope and the promise for all of us. For the Lord himself, come a day when all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth the bible said out of the mouth of two or more witnesses let every word be established so let's not just hang in john let's just not go to first thessalonians let's not just stick around revelation but let's take a trip back to job and job said if a man dies shall he live again he said all the days of my appointed time will i wait 
until my change come. For he will call and I will answer him for he will have a desire for the works of his hands. None of that changed when Jesus came. None of that changed when Jesus ascended. None of that changed when the apostles took over the church. The doctrine of the resurrection was never changed or altered from Job to Jesus, from Jesus to Paul, and from Paul to John the Revelator. It is the same coherent message throughout the word of God. I know men want to change it, but it is not changed in the word of God. For the Bible said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Days coming when all who are in the grave shall hear his voice with the voice of an archangel and with the tr and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now I want to tell you if anything was different here, Paul would have told him. If anything had changed from Job, Paul would have told him. If anything had turned around from Jesus Paul would have told him but the fact of the matter is is nothing changed so he didn't say comfort one another with anything else he said wherefore comfort one another with these words and Paul said if any man or any angel come preaching any other gospel except that which you have received from us, let him be cursed. The fact of the matter is we are still looking for the coming of Jesus Christ and for the resurrection of the dead. Oh, thank you, God, that they're sleeping now, but they won't sleep long for the Lord's coming. And he's got a desire for the works of his hands. And when he calls, every sheep that knows his voice oh hallelujah that's the reason why when he said Lazarus come forth nobody else in that tomb came out because my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow but when he said Lazarus come forth Lazarus is the one that came up out of that grave I'm telling you saints it is our hope if we let go of that hope for some other crazy doctrine we have lost the word of God there is nothing in the scripture to substantiate anything else and somebody said, well, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present. No, the Bible does not say that. Paul is actually dealing with the heresy that was coming in from the, from, 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 from the, 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 the heathen of his day. They were bringing in their Greek knowledge that said when you die, the soul leaves the body. But Paul said, we shall not be found naked. So if I, if, I, if I go now, I'm not getting my body yet because the body doesn't come until the last trumpet. Oh, come on, somebody. And Paul starts it out by saying, we earnestly groan within ourselves, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. When is that going to take place? At the last trumpet, Paul. So what's going on right now? They're sleeping, waiting for their body. That's what they're doing right now. The Bible said there is no work, no device, no knowledge in the grave whether thou goest. They're sleeping right now. They're just sleeping, that's all. They have no consciousness of time, space. They have no idea that things are taking place. The moment that Paul had his head cut off and he lost consciousness of this world, it will seem to him as if you just absolutely snapped your fingers and his eyes will open up to see Jesus oh God so Paul said don't bring that into this church nobody's going to just move out a live soul and be up in the heavens floating around naked we don't have naked souls floating around he said that's not how it happens they're going to be clothed upon with their house which is from heaven well when will that happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corrupt 
corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruption shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have been put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written oh God death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your sting oh grave where is your victory I'm so thankful saints of God that we are not without hope but we have tremendous hope in Jesus Christ I can't wait for my grandparents to come to life to be waken out of their sleep because I'm going to see Jesus with them I can't wait saints of God for my elders and leaders of the past to reanimate in their immortal bodies because this body has got to obey gravity because it's made from the earth but my God my next house gravity has no hold on me because it's made in the heavens oh, hallelujah we used to sing a song back in the church, don't you weep for me when I'm gone, for I won't have to leave here alone. But when I hear that trumpet sound, my feet won't stay on the ground. I'm gonna rise with a shout, gonna rise. You say, why does it matter? Because it was written. And when I hear people say, well, doctrine doesn't matter, the demeaning the word of God. Normally people that say that doctrine doesn't matter is because they cannot afford for their doctrine to be challenged because they know if it is ever challenged, they will not be able to defend it. So I get into rooms with ministers and they say doctrine doesn't matter and I all of a sudden know you don't know what you're talking about. You're terrified for that to be challenged because you know it doesn't hold any water. I can't afford to believe what sounds good to me. I have to believe what was written from the word of God. Anything outside of that is heresy. And so Paul's dealing with this in 2 Thessalonians. He's dealing with this situation. Because, you know, you hear people running around time. Oh, the Lord could come back at any moment. I mean, the Lord, I mean, the Lord is going to come back soon. I mean, it's, it could happen at any time. It cannot. It cannot happen any time. You say, prove that to me. All right, let's read. And now, what about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to meet him? When does that happen? Second Thessalonians 2. When does that happen? When are we gathered together with him? It is coming. Go, Xander. Hurry, son. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So when are we all gathered to him? Okay, it's at his coming. That's what Paul said. Please don't be upset or excited, dear brothers, by the rumor that this day of the Lord has already begun. Don't, don't get excited. He said, if you hear people having visions and special messages from God about this or letters that are supposed to have come from me, don't believe them. Don't believe them. If you hear them telling you this, oh, I had a dream and I had a vision. Uh, uh, if your vision and your dream is not in the word of God, hey amen, you ate something real crazy that night and it's just manifested in a ridiculous dream. There are people that say, well, if you read the word of God, it tells you Jesus could come back at any moment. Well, Paul said that's not true, so don't believe them. He said, don't be carried away and deceived regardless of what they say. For that day will not come until two things happen. Now, I'm going to tell you what we're looking for. Not looking for red heifers. Not looking for them. Not looking for them. We're looking for two things. First, there will be a time of great rebellion against God. Great rebellion. Not only in the world but in the church. The Bible says that many will depart from the faith. There's going to be a great rebellion against God. That's the first thing we're looking for. The next thing that we're looking for is the man of rebellion will come the son of hell or the son of perdition is what the King James says. Those are the two things we're looking for. And he's going to do this. 
He will defy every god there is and tear down every other object of adoration and worship. He will go in and sit as God in the temple of God claiming that himself is God. That's what we're looking for. Until this happens, the Lord will not come back. So, saints of God, that's the reason why I'm telling you, don't let your heart be troubled with things that you see in the world. The Lord has just painted the picture for us and said, children, this is what you look for. Outside of this, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't, be, don't, don't, don't freak out. Don't go, go into a frantic, craze, a frantic craze because somehow somebody with reverend in front of their name is declaring that anything could happen at any moment. He said, no, don't, don't be troubled. There are two things that have got to happen. There has to be a great rebellion against God. That great rebellion sets up the runway for the landing of the Antichrist. And he will come. And he will throw down all worship. Everything that is adored and worshipped, he will throw it down. And then he will exalt himself and sit in the temple of God, declare himself to be God. That's what we're looking for. Anything else is a distraction. And what we have to understand, children of God, is the enemy is the master of distraction. He'll throw something over here and get you looking at it because he's doing something over there and he doesn't want you to see it. So the best way for you to continue to keep your vision clear, look at somebody near you and tell them it's the word. Paul said, don't you remember that I told you this when I was with you? And you know what is keeping him from being here already. For he can come only when his time is ready. He said, look, you understand that God's not ready for him yet. And the only time he's going to be able to come is when the Lord steps out of the way and looses him and lets him go. That's it. So don't be troubled. Don't freak out. Oh, they're, they're going to build a temple over there. That's fine, whatever. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for this. These two things is what we're looking for. When these things take place, number one, still don't let your heart be troubled. For Jesus said, when you see all these things come to pass, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. We're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquake in diverse places. There's going to be multitudes of things that are going to be taking place all at the same time. When these things are happening, Matthew 24, when these things are happening, don't let your heart be troubled. You say, why, why won't it freak you out? No, what it'll tell me is Jesus is coming. Every prophetic utterance that is fulfilled just lets me know Jesus is coming. Jesus is on his way. And there's not a child of God who loves the Lord that don't want to see him. Somebody said, well, I just want the Lord to kind of restrain himself so that my children can grow up. Well, in what world? You want them to grow up in the world? They can be murdered, harmed, and molested? Or do you want them to grow up in the world where they will not harm nor molest at all on my holy mountain? <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah, where the lion and the ox will eat straw together, where the sheep and the wolf will lay down together, where the child will put his hand on the cockatrice stand and the suckling child. Come on, who, who, who doesn't want to be in that world? I want my grandchildren to grow up in that world. Lord, may they see your kingdom. May your kingdom come and may they grow up in a world where the glory of God, my God, we won't have to worry about a son of the moon because we as the children of God will shine so brightly with the glory of the Lord that <laughs> so we got to be careful saints of God false doctrine is the enemy of the church and that's the reason why it matters it's not listen some I, I've had people accuse me and say well brother Jared he just talks about this stuff because he wants to be right ah, they don't know me it's not that I want to be right. I just want to get it right. Because I know the only way for me to be stable is if I get it right. For wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. The only way for me not to be tossed to and fro and to be, and, and, and to be unsettled in my spirit is for me to just look in the word of God and say, this is right. This is right. Now, Paul dealing with Timothy here in 1 Timothy says this. 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now let's talk about that because there's a lot of people don't think, well, if I'm if I'm in the faith, I can't. I'm, I'm good. No matter what, I'm good to go. I'm, I'm good. That's not Bible. That is conjured up in the mind of man. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing. Well, you know, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of uh, of promise until the day of redemption. So God takes our soul and puts it in a jar and puts a big tight lid on it. It's airtight and nothing can touch me. That's not what that word sealed there is. It's not being sealed in a jar. It's being stamped for ownership. That's all it is. Man can make up all kinds of crazy mess to prove their garbage really is what it is. And so Paul said, I want you to understand. In 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, first verse, I want you to understand that this is going to take place. The Spirit is declaring expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. They will depart. So I don't believe that's possible. Go to Romans 1. Because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They knew God. You say, well, those are people that knew about God, but they didn't serve God. Then go to Hebrews 6. Let's go to Hebrews 6. Go to Hebrews 6, 1, Sammy. We got to get this right, saints, because I'm telling you, if we tell people the wrong doctrine, it'll, per, it'll turn their life into hell, and their life, they'll be lawless in their life. And they're going to have to stand before God and give an answer for every deed done. Why would I want children of God to have to stand there and give an answer for every deed done? Because I told them they could do what they want and still be saved. All they've got to do is profess love for Jesus. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance of dead works, faith toward God. Keep going. Of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Keep going. For it is impossible. I didn't write this. Either Paul or Apollos wrote this. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them and again under repentance, seeing they have crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. You say, I don't believe that can happen. They wouldn't have written it. This is a warning to every child of God that if you fall away, it is possible for you to completely go to a place where you can never come back again. You can be turned to a reprobate and never ever desire to be in the presence of God again, to never desire the word of God again. Children of God, this is a dangerous place for people to get into when they feel like they can live like hell and make it into heaven. It's not going to happen. Somebody's got to rise up and cry aloud and spare not and tell Israel of their sins and declare to Jacob his iniquity somebody's got to say look children of God let us return unto the Lord let us repent and be converted so that times of refreshing can come from the presence of God you look in the Old Testament they didn't have the Holy Ghost the blood of Christ was not yet applied but they were faithful to offer sacrifice men and women laid down their lives gave up everything dwelt in tents and caves of the earth my God but we who have now got the blood and the Holy Ghost we can just live like whatever and we're going to have the same reward as them the devil is a liar it is a deception I believe from the bottom of my heart this is the great delusion that has been sent unto the church that they should believe a lie and be damned who had pleasure in unrighteousness and who didn't love the truth my God raise up a generation that loves the truth wake up a generation that declares I got to be holy for you are holy can't do it in myself but thank God for the grace of God thank God for the Holy Ghost thank God for the word of God I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind I got all power to tread upon serpent and Say, Pastor, you sound a little upset. I am a little angry tonight. I've watched a generation of young people that I loved 
I don't even know how many of them are serving God faithfully. I've watched them destroyed because they thought as long as they declared love for Jesus. You say, well, you know, is that wrong? Many will come into me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in your name? See, there must be, there must be some good, because I've, I've been to churches that preach this stuff and moves of God take place and demons are cast out and people are healed. Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? And in your name, have we not done many wonderful works? And he will say unto, and I will say unto them in that day, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't care what you did with my name. Yeah, my name has power. I don't care what you did in my name. You were full of sin and lawlessness and iniquity. Oh God, how could we dare to live a lifestyle that Christ came to set us free from? The modern church thinks that we're set free to be comfortable in our sin, but really, he set me free to put sin underneath my feet. He set me free to overcome every work of the devil. He set me free to overcome every work of the flesh. I refuse to accept that I am a victim. The devil is a liar. I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. <laughs> Them old saints got victory over it. What's wrong with this generation? It's false doctrine is what's wrong with this generation. My God, help us to love the truth. He said, many are going to depart from the faith. How, how could this happen? Because they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Oh, my God. And they're going to, those seducing spirits and those doctrines of devils, they're going to be speaking lies in hypocrisy. Because their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Most men that I know preach this foolishness. It's because they're trying to cover up their own guilty conscience. Why don't you just come down, put sin under the blood, and let's go on with it. Why do you got to damn everybody else around you because you won't repent? Why don't you just come on down to the altar and say, Lord, forgive me a sinner. God, cover me by the blood. Wash me. God in heaven. Hallelujah, it's pride, it's ego. Oh God, don't ever let me get so lifted up in myself that when I know I have failed you, that I can't find my way to the altar and find grace to help me in my time of need. Oh, hallelujah, the Lord has made a way for us. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. He said, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God for the blood. Oh, what can make me white as snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You ain't got to cover up your guilty conscience. We got blood on this thing. All you got to do is come find the fact. Mountain. Oh. Oh. Get yourself under the fountain. Let him clean you up. Don't pervert my spirit. Get down and get yours right. Hallelujah. Don't pervert the word of God. Just get it right. They speak lies and hypocrisy. <laughs> I've been declared self-righteous. That's because they don't know me. Hallelujah. The only righteousness I got is the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. And if you're telling me the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ is addiction and fornication and adultery, you're blaspheming God. And you better get your mouth under control because the righteousness that has been bestowed upon me, the grace of God, which bringeth salvation unto all men, hath appeared unto us in these last days, teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live righteously, soberly, and godly. 
rightly in this present world. Oh, it ain't my righteousness that makes me live holy. It's the righteousness that was given to me by the blood of Calvary. Oh, hallelujah. I ain't got to go drink. I ain't got to go sleep around. I ain't got to put nothing in my veins or up my nose. I have found the most high. He's holy. He's righteous. And he's making me like it. Help us, Jesus, because there's a highway there, and it is called the way of holiness, and the ungodly will not err therein, but it's going to be for the righteous saints of and the redeemed of the Lord. I return unto Zion with singing and everlasting joy on there. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad he set me free. I'm so glad he's destroying every bondage. I'm so glad he's tearing down every stronghold. I'm so glad that I'm not the man I used to be. May not be what I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I'm being changed. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. The behavior of that old Adam, it was crucified with Christ. I don't even long for it anymore. I long for holiness and righteousness, sanctification. Oh, God. But it's seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. They speak lies and hypocrisy because their conscience. The only way you could stand up and preach this junk is if your conscience is seared. There's one time in my life. I believed that mess for about a minute. And I got up and tried to say it. <laughs> Thank God, the Holy Ghost. Thank God that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because the Holy Ghost reached over and put his hand on my mouth and said, you won't speak that from those lips. The devil is a liar. Oh, hallelujah. I don't have to worry, saints of God. <laughs> about trying to do this on my own. I don't have to worry about it doing it on my own strength for it is not by might nor by power but it is by the spirit of the Lord. Oh, I'm so thankful that he's changing us, saints of God till when we stand before him. We won't stand before him as derelicts. We won't stand before him as the heathen but when he sees us, he'll see himself and when I see him, I'll see see him in me and I will know him because I will see him as he is. Oh, hallelujah. He said, I will be unto you a refiner's fire, a refiner of silver and a fuller soap. You know what fuller soap is? It's a bleaching agent. It takes white garments that have been stained and the fuller soap begins to wash and as it washes, it takes out the stain until all you can see is white. Oh, aren't you so glad that though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them white as snow. I'm so glad that when my garment was spotted, the Holy One of Israel, oh, hallelujah, the sovereign son of the living God came down, born of a virgin, died on a cross, shed his blood, and oh, I found that fountain and when I sin, if I feel conviction, confess my sin, turn from my iniquity, the fuller soap comes out and begins to wash me. And he said, I'll cover you until the shame of that nakedness does no longer appear. I'm not going to preach a powerless people. I'm not going to preach a powerless people. You're the children of the most high God. You're the elect lady. You're the church of the firstborn. Most men that preach the foolishness is because they won't deal with the sin in their life. You know how many times I stand at this pulpit and while I'm preaching, I just want to throw the microphone down and hit the altar and say, God, forgive me. Because the word is touching me. 
if it ever stops, oh God, somebody get a hold of me. If I run to riot business and excess, if I go, saints of God, into sin and iniquity, somebody get a hold of me. Because the moment that I can sin and not feel the sear of conviction, oh God, I've been, I'm, I'm on the verge of never being able to come back. But I thank God that Jesus didn't leave us without a promise, but he talked to us about a prodigal. Oh, hallelujah. He was in the Father's house and he wanted all his substance. He didn't say, just give me all my money. He said, let me have all my substance. And the father divided to them his substance. And he went out and he spent all of his substance on a riotous living. Oh, what a shame if the story had ended there. What hopelessness if the story had culminated with the loss of the son. But Jesus said, I got to tell you, the story doesn't end there. And I want you to look at somebody tell him it didn't end there for me either. It didn't end there for me either. The story didn't end when I ran out. Hallelujah. The story began when I ran out. And the Lord let me go. He let me go into all kinds of drunkenness and riotousness and excess. Oh, God, I thought it was fun for a while until I exhausted every strength I had, until all my substance was gone. And when I was down at the trough, getting ready to eat that which the swine did eat, the reason why he used his swine, because in Jewish culture there's not a dirtier animal I was getting ready to go down with the filthy animal and eat what the beast eat but I'm so thankful that the Lord won't leave you at the trough of a beast I'm so thankful that the Lord won't leave you there but the Bible said when he was about I don't believe this boy had an epiphany I believe the spirit of God touched him aren't you so glad that the spirit of God got a hold of you I didn't come to Jesus because I thought it was a good idea but no man can come unto me except the spirit of my father draw him there are some of us at the trough getting ready to indulge the belly of the beast but oh thank God that the Holy Ghost moved upon us and the Bible said that the boy came to himself and he said my God even the slaves eat better in my father's house than this I will arise oh that's when you know there's real repentance there he didn't say I'm going back as a son he said I'll be satisfied just to be a servant oh hallelujah and the father didn't chase after him but he looked for him. Oh, I'm so glad that God didn't give up on us. I'm so glad that he was looking for us and the father ran out, put his coat on him. He said, you're still my son. Aren't you so glad that you're still? <laughs> but the story doesn't end there. They celebrated the return of the son who was dead but is alive. But one of the sons stayed. Sometimes the one that stayed gets a bad rap. But he stayed. You say, what was the benefit of staying? His brother spent all his inheritance. And the father said, everything I got left is yours. Uh, I told our children in chapel today, I said, don't leave the house. Whatever you do, stay in the house of God. Oh, you ain't got to come back empty. You ain't got to come back empty. You can stay and be full. Doesn't mean you won't mess up. Doesn't mean temptation won't overtake you and you might fall into sin. But it's better for you to be here than to be out there. Whatever you do, don't you leave the house. Because there is a blessing to those who are faithful. That's the reason why we can't tie the hands of unfaithful people with the hands of faithful people and think that somehow we're all going to get the same reward. We we might get eternal life but there's some glory held up for those that stay faithful there's some glory that's held up for those that will stay in the house so preachers we got to examine ourselves why am I preaching this if I'm preaching it why am I preaching and, and, and most preachers that I know now won't even take their Bibles up to the desk they won't do it because if they preached from the word they couldn't preach what they're preaching 
And so they spend hours philosophically lecturing God's people. But the wisdom of God doesn't stand in the wisdom of man. It doesn't. It's the word of God that's right. No matter how I feel about it, it's right there. Sometimes I read that word and I'm like, well, I can't understand how that could be right. And then I just have to remind myself, as for God, all of his ways are perfect. It's right. Look at somebody near you tell me it's right. It really is right. God, I got so much here. The son of man is revealed. Or the son of perdition is revealed. When the son of perdition is revealed, he deceives the nations through signs, lying wonders. That's the reason why we got to be careful. Got to be careful. Well, the power of God, it doesn't matter. What's well, the lifestyle? It does not matter what's going on. What matters is where's your character? Is there holiness in the house? Is righteousness reigning? Because the enemy has power. And he is, able to tr he is able to replicate things that would make you think God is in the house. Somebody said, I saw people go down to the altar. They can go down to the altar until Jesus comes. If they don't change, they never repented. The altar is not there to adjust my conscience. The altar is there to deal with my character. Come on, somebody. It's not there just to make me not feel guilty anymore. It's there to bring me to a place of sacrifice to where I don't have to ever again endure the guilt of that shame because I no longer indulge in that habit. We've got to be careful because the enemy can produce. Listen, there are miracles that have substantial miracles that have happened in Catholicism. It doesn't make it a real religion. Just because miracles happen doesn't mean that God's with it. The enemy knows how to deceive God's people. Simon goes down into Samaria, starts doing all this sorcery. Had power. And he deceived everybody around him. Power. Oh. But then Philip comes down. My God. He had a word that the sorcerer couldn't even contest. And it wasn't the signs that Philip did. It was the word he preached that delivered those people. My God. The word broke the stronghold of the enemy's deception. My God. It's going to happen when Jesus comes. Because this son of perdition is going to be giving himself out that he's God. He'll even be able to call fire down from heaven. And he'll declare he's God. But the Bible said he will be destroyed. By the brightness of his coming and the words of his mouth. Because it doesn't matter what the sorcerer does. When the real thing comes in the... <laughs> Hallelujah. And when they believed on the preaching of, of Philip and Jerusalem had heard. Oh, they're all repentant and baptized. None of them got the Holy Ghost yet. They all repented. They all baptized. Ain't none of them got the Holy Ghost yet. Peter and John said, oh, this is our time. Let's go on down to Samaria. Because they have believed on the gospel. They've been baptized in his name. But oh, I remember when he was about to go up into heaven. And he said, go tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high and when Peter and John came down they begin to pray over those people and people begin to receive the Holy Ghost and the manifestation was so powerful that Simon who was accustomed to physical manifestation that would give him glory and credit that would bring him profit saw something he ain't never seen in his life and he said my God what kind of money do I got to give you in order 
good to receive that power. But I'm so glad that there was a real man of God standing there that wasn't about to sell out for nobody, but said, Simon, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness. You have no lot or part with us. You better go pray right now. You better go pray right now that God don't destroy you. Oh, God, we need real men of God that can stand up against the sorcerers and can say, I don't care what kind of power you think you have. Let me tell you about the word of God because it is not the sorcery that sets me free. It is not, saints of God, the magic that sets me free. It is the truth. For Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There ain't no freedom like when a man of God stands to his feet and begins to declare the eternal word of God that all of a sudden touches your heart and you say, oh God, I feel freedom in this place. I feel an anointing about to destroy a yoke in my life. I hope somebody in here and somebody watching, I pray that this word is destroying the sorcerer over your life. May God cast down the spells that have been spoken into your ears until you long for truth, until you hunger again, until you say, Lord, I went out in rebellion, but I'm going to come back in humility. I want to know you. You understand, when false doctrine is being preached, it's not Jesus standing to his feet. There's a sorcerer empowered by the enemy of God to wrap you up in deception. But there ain't nothing feels like the truth. Oh God. Woo. Those spells might feel good to my flesh. <laughs> oh, but I, God, when I hear a man of God preach the word, I feel like I feel I feel like I feel like uh, uh, John the Baptist's mother. I, I, I feel something jump up in my womb. <laughs> I feel I feel a I feel a second witness start to witness for me and say that's truth right there. That's a real word of God. <laughs> oh, hallelujah! Because you have to understand, children of God. Satan is also a father. He is the father of lies. And he is the father of deceit. And he is a father of them that walk in both. You say Satan can be somebody's father. Jesus said they could. He could. He said you seek to kill me. Because you're of your father the devil. And the deeds of your father. You will do. And when men out of a seared conscience will stand to their feet and bewitch God's people so that they don't ever have to stand accountable for their evil actions, then saints of God, somebody's father is using them in the house of God to deceive God's people. You have to understand Satan came in the garden. I don't believe the devil can come into the church. It's too holy. There wasn't nothing holier than the garden. There wasn't nothing more pure, perfect than the garden. And Satan walked in there to deceive as well. Don't you think because somebody's collar is turned backwards and reverend is in front of their name and a church logo is on top of their doorstep that Jesus is in the house. Oh, hallelujah. He said, you are not of my church but of the synagogue of Satan because there's something else being preached in there. And when there's another Jesus and another gospel and another spirit, I'm out. I got to I want us to understand the value of truth. I've got so much more. But truth makes me free. I don't have to worry about events that are transpiring. Why? Because tonight, when I found out what I need to look for, I'm free of the worry. If it takes place, persecution comes upon the church. So many people think, well, I see this post. Before the Antichrist appears, the rapture will take place. <laughs> My God. 
Well, who's he going to make? What saints is he going to make war with? Who's he going to persecute? It's a bunch of foolishness. It's not word. It, it, actually, that whole idea was dreamed up by some teenage girl back in the 1800s. And they started preaching it as doctrine. The word of God is true. And you say, well, what happens if they persecute, persecute me? Oh, the truth has made me free because blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For great is your reward in heaven. Ooh. And you say, when am I going to get that reward? Well, the Bible said that Jesus is coming and his rewards are with him. And he will reward every man according as his work shall be. It's there, saints. It's all there. Oh, well, if a man dies, where is he? Where, where's he at? Job said, I will make my bed in the grave. He said, the worm shall be my mother and decay shall be my sister. That's, that's where I'll be. I'll be in the grave. But, well, well, if you're in the grave, what's going to happen to you? The Lord will remember me. <laughs> the Lord will remember me. Amen. You say, well, your, your godly grandmother, isn't she looking down on you right now? Show me that. Show me that. Show me that in the scripture. There's nothing there in the scripture that says that. There's nothing. That's, that's conjured up. It's made up in your mind. All the days of my appointed time will I wait. Daniel 12. Michael the archangel, that great prince, will stand before the people of God. He will stand upon the earth and many that sleep in the dust shall arise. Some Unto resurrection, unto life, others resurrection, unto damnation. We want to make stuff up in our mind because it makes us feel more comforted. There's nothing more comforting than the word of God. Hallelujah. There are saints right now that are asleep. That I preached over their funerals. They're just sleeping. No knowledge, no device, no work in the grave where it all goes. They're just sleeping. They're just resting. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. For they rest from their labors and their works do follow them. They're just resting right now. That's all. Just asleep. Just resting from their labors. And saints of God, if I'm alive unto the coming of the Lord, whether it be in Islam or Oak Hill, come on, somebody. Somewhere on the church grounds. <laughs> Doesn't matter where they are. Whew. They're going to hear his voice. And ain't no grave. <laughs> going to hold my body down. <laughs> Glory to God. And he's going to say, come forth. And the most powerful earthquake you've ever seen in your entire life is going to take place. Because everywhere the saints of God are resting, the ground will begin to shake. The graves will begin to burst open. And they won't come out in these fickle, cursed, earthly bodies that are susceptible to sickness, disease, and death. But Jesus said, I will give you a body like my body. Hi, <sighs> God, they will come up out of those graves immortal, powerful, good God in heaven, and he will catch us up into the clouds, and then he will take us before the throne. Somebody said, well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Well, Jesus said it, David, or Peter said it this way. He said, let me speak to you plainly concerning the patriarch David. I don't want you to be confused. Because you remember back in the Psalms when he said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I see the Holy One to see, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. You remember when he was talking about that? He wasn't talking about himself. 
But let me speak plainly to you about him. He is both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. For David has not ascended unto the heavens. And Jesus made that plain. He said, no man has ascended unto heaven except he that first came down. And somebody will say, well, that's right. But after Jesus died, many of the saints were resurrected and were seen by many. Okay, let's think about this. All right, let's think about this. We're talking about first century. Okay? Abraham resurrects. And he's walking around town. People are like, I think that's Father Abraham. They wouldn't have known Abraham from their next door neighbor that they never talked to. It was people that had just died that the people around them knew because it was a witness unto the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible said when he ascended on high, he led them captives captive. So he took the captives and made them captive. I thought whom the son says... Which, <laughs> That literally means nothing concerning the resurrection. It means he took those captive who were always taken captive. So in other words, he bound the power of the devil. That's all it means. It means nothing else. It's, we're just reading into stuff because we want to prove a point. The truth is that from Adam until today, all those who have died are resting, asleep. They're just asleep. They're just asleep. That's what the Bible says. I didn't make that up. That's what the Bible says. They're asleep. Many which sleep in the dust. We will not prevent them which are asleep. They're just sleeping. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth they rest from their labors, their works they follow. They're just asleep. No device, no knowledge, no work in the grave where they go. Just asleep. In a total unconscious state. They don't know. When I close my eyes in death, I will immediately open my eyes to life. Because there's no knowledge of passing of time. I'm just asleep, resting. But then at the time appointed of the Father. Good God. When Israel takes their stiff neck and turns it to the Lord. And cries out for their Messiah. The Bible said he will come out of his place as he did in the day of battle. God. He will hear them and say, they are my people. And they will say, you are our God. When that happens, God in heaven, after two-thirds of the nation is completely wiped out or taken captive, a third remaining, they cry out to him. He finally breaks that stiff neck of theirs and they call out to him and he comes out of his place and he shouts, my God in heaven, and the saints come up. My God, all of a sudden, we which are alive and remain are changed to be like him. And planet earth loses its hold and we all begin to go up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He then takes us up into the sea of glass before the throne of God. And all of a sudden, the vials of wrath begin to be poured out. And he pounds this earth over and over again. While the vials of wrath are taking place, we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he's confessing our names before his Father and before his angels. And we are, oh God, casting our crowns down. And we are singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Oh God. Finally, the last vial is poured out upon the earth. These nations are gathered against Israel, battling, rifling the houses, ravishing the women, selling the children off for wine and for harlots. God. But he will not suffer his people to be destroyed. For the Bible said there will be a remnant left. 
according to the election of grace. God. Hallelujah. 144,000. 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. God, he'll take his name and stamp it in their foreheads. God. Oh, hallelujah. And the armies of heaven will come down. Jesus and his saints with him. God in heaven. And in that valley of Megiddo, we will put down all the powers of this world. We will take them into the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And we will press them out in the valley of Megiddo until the blood runs up to the horse's bridle. And in one moment, all of the nations of the earth will be conquered. And we will get on the highway. And we, as the children of God, with our leader the bishop of our souls the lamb of God and the lion of the tribe of Judah we will march with him into Jerusalem and he will sit down on the throne of his father David oh hallelujah oh glory to God and that's the reason why you cannot be deceived with this false eternal security doctrine because when we get into that city it will be a lush paradise water will come out from under the throne it will go and it will heal the nations oh God every nation that receives him but at this moment there will come those who thought they were children of God but refuse to deal with the lawlessness in their own heart refuse to put iniquity under the blood of Jesus Christ refuse to overcome sin because they like the indulgence of the flesh and they like the vice of the world and they love the pleasure of sin more than they were lovers of God and they will come to him declaring unto him we cast out devils in your name we healed the sick in your name Lord in your name we did many wonderful works and he will say depart from me ye that work iniquity and they will look into the city Jesus said when you see Abraham Isaac Jacob the prophets standing in the kingdom of God but you yourself thrust out there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because they will look into the city which is bright shining with the glory of God for the glory of the Lord shall be the light of the city the lights of the world will be glorified in their bodies and we will light up Jerusalem but they will turn around to an absolute devastation nuclear fallout armies of the world lying in ruin beasts of the field decaying in the ground the waters spoiled and cursed vegetation dead and they will see what they miss and they will turn and see what they have gained and they will drive themselves crazy they will go mad I don't want to be outside the gate I don't want to be outside the gate oh but when I get inside oh when I get inside of that gate I'll be so happy praising my savior when I get inside of the gate oh Lord God help me get Jared under control more grace God help me get this flesh under control more grace God kill it every day more grace God until I know forfeit the city of God because I refuse to lay down down the flesh that I so loved oh God help me crucify this flesh with its affections and lusts so that I can go inside the gate so I can watch Jesus sit down on the throne of his father David so I can have access to the tree of life so I can see the crystal river that will come out of the throne of Christ oh God so I can be in the place where the lion and the ox will be straw together so I can be in the place where they will not harm nor molest in all of his holy mountain God don't let me miss the city because I refuse to deal with myself but God help me to understand that holiness without it no man shall see the Lord and you have given unto me all things that pertain to life and godliness I am not without anything to conquer this flesh I am not without anything to put this sin under my feet I am not without anything oh God that's the reason why Paul said let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body it's over now you're no longer in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwelleth in 
you. Oh God, and the Bible said if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Oh God, I'm so grateful that the master of sin no longer has a whip to my back. I have been set free. The Christ, the Christos, the anointed one came and destroyed that yoke and now I can take the yoke of Christ upon me and I can live a holy life. I can separate myself unto Jesus Christ. I can condemn this world by the righteousness of God that is readily active in my life. Oh, I feel him now. I can look at the addict and say, I know that you can be free. I can look at the whoremonger and say, I know that you can be holy. I can look at the prostitute and say, I know that you can be free. The chain has been broken. The yoke has been destroyed. Prison has been opened. Child, run on. Be free in the name of Jesus. Awake to righteousness and sin not. That's the gospel. The gospel is not a feeling. It's a fact. It's real. It's power. It's hope. Oh, he's my hope, saints. Ain't nobody else going to get me up out of that grave. We got to be free. My God. I was praying today, I said, Lord, let the spirit fall upon all the pulpits until they desire truth in the inward parts, until they return to the word of God, until the anchor is no longer their own seared conscience or their own philosophical mind, but until their anchor is the very words of God. How could I think like him without his word? Seeing his thoughts are as far from mine as the heavens are from thee. Oh, God. Who, who, how could I be his counselor? He doesn't need me, for he has determined all things after the counsel of his own will. He doesn't need my opinion. Can you see how exalted we become when we start preaching things that do not pertain to the word of God? What we're saying is I know more about mercy than God knows. I know more about grace than God knows. I know more about righteousness than God knows. Saints of God, I've tried my best tonight to preach to you just the word of God. And it may, I may say, oh, I've never heard anything like that before. That's fine. That's fine. You have now. And it's in the scripture. I'm not going to feed you something. That is not the bread of God's word. To make myself feel. Because as far as I know, I've not taught eternal security around here. As far as I know, I've not taught moving out of life soul around here. I can understand why anybody's agreeing with that stuff in this church on posts on Facebook. So I just liked it. Doesn't matter. You like it, you give consent to it. You come into agreement with what you like. And people have heard your testimony and heard, saw you on Facebook and now you're on. What would you do if somebody came on there and said, well, I believe that the God of the Old Testament is Satan and I go on there and like it. What would you do? You would say, oh, pastor done lost his mind. If I went on there and somebody said, well, I, I, I just believe that all you have to do is confess the name of Jesus and you're good to go from now on out. And I said, oh, I like that. Nobody would come in here that next service feeling real comfortable. They'd be like, oh, what kind of crazy doctrine is he about to talk to us about? That carries weight, saints. Whatever you like, you give consent to. And somebody said, I didn't read the whole post. Do it from now on out. Eternal security is a lie. It's a lie. And when you start seeing people talking about, well, people can't be unsaved, and you like that, you liked false doctrine. You liked it. You gave consent to that filth. 
And you didn't have to. For what reason? Did it make us feel like, oh, we're a good Christian person and we, you know, we, we've shown love? That's not love. If I consent to false doctrine, that's not love. Eternal security is what has brought most of God's people to damnation by now. Why would I agree with that? Why would I do that? Give consent to that filth? No way. No way. I can be comforting without giving consent to false doctrine. I don't have to do that. Prayers. God comfort. God strengthen. I don't have to consent to people that are using crisis as a platform to preach their false doctrine. I don't have to do that. It's a shame they do it anyways. It's not the time or place. Comfort the family. Ask God to help the family. You don't have to go on there and preach your platform. That's not true. It's not true. That's the reason why we ought to warn every man. Preach to every man truth. Consent only unto the word of God. You say, Pastor Jared, you're just a hard man. I'm not a hard man. If you saw the devastation I saw in the people that I grew up with, you wouldn't be thinking I'm a hard man. Someone we don't even know where they're at. They're missing. I look at other churches who are still holding the line of righteousness and holiness, and they're young people. Now they're multi-generations into church. My generation is almost altogether lost. What, doctor, what did that doctrine do for us? Pop your suspenders. Act like you gave something to God's people. You did nothing but promise them liberty but cause them to be servants to sin. It is filth. Now, God, take your great fishing line. Throw it into the pond and reel them on back home. Somebody said, well, we didn't have to wear skirts all the time anymore. We got free to wear pants. Well, good for you. Good. I'm glad. I got to cut my hair a little bit. <laughs> got to, I got to grow a beard, y'all. That's not freedom. That's still flesh. You're still focusing on the flesh is all it is. It's not freedom. Growing a beard doesn't make me feel righteous or unrighteous. That's not freedom. Freedom is when the word of God gets down in your heart. And it makes such a change in your spirit that you no longer walk the path you used to. How many of y'all are so glad that you're not whoremongering anymore? That you're, that you're not addicts anymore? How many of y'all are so glad that you're not bitter anymore? How many of y'all are so glad, saints of God? Oh, Jesus. Look what the Lord has done in your life. You get to go to bed and lay your head down on a pillow with a clean conscience. Oh, God. And I don't have to get up in this pulpit and pet you all the time and say, Oh, child of God, I know you're living like hell, but Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I can just get up here and preach to you the truth because I don't have to worry about that mess. You want to know why? Because you understand conviction. You understand the need for the blood. You understand repentance. You understand the ability to be free. I don't have to get up and reaffirm sin as if it's some light thing. Sin is what cost us everything. God gave them one law. The Bible said sin is a transgression of the law. He gave them one law. Don't eat of that tree. Satan came in and deceived them. Like it wasn't no big deal. Has he changed his tactics? You know what he did? He came into the church and the Lord said, don't do these things. Don't, don't do these things. Don't, don't. And it's not Old Testament law. Read the apostles. They wrote it. Don't sin, don't curse your neighbor, don't lie, don't steal. All these are still in the New Testament. Don't commit fornication, don't commit adultery. It's all in the New Testament. It's all there. And God says, here, just follow my word. And then Satan comes in and says, did God really say? Did God say? And instead of people being Bereans and going back and looking in their Bible and say, I don't know, did he? They just said, hmm, well, he's a preacher. He must know. No. No, saints of God. That's why Jim Jones are successful. Because nobody goes to the word and says, is that right? I told the brothers a long time ago, I said, I'm not doing good preaching unless I provoke you to go home and study. If while I'm preaching, you go, no. 
about that. Let me go see if that's really right. It's okay. Paul said the Bereans were more noble than the men of Thessalonica, for they went to the scriptures to see if those things be so. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm discouraging you from reading your Bible, if I'm not even preaching from the Bible, there's something strange going on in the water. Because all we have is the Word. I got nothing else. I'm not smart enough, saints. I'm not intelligent enough. I don't have a brilliant enough mind. Maybe some people are just class A genius. I mean, maybe, maybe they've got all these incredible thoughts. I don't. The only way I know how God thinks about anything is for me to read his word. And the only thing I can tell you is what he said. So saints of God, let's be noble. Let's be mindful, thoughtful. You can erase your witness in somebody's life by not thinking about what you're doing. Don't ever do that. And I've seen some of us in here do this. Stop. Stop and think. Wait a minute, let me read this. Especially if you see who it's coming from. There ought to be a quick, like, <laughs> let me look at this whole thing here. The Bible said, know them that labor among you. Mark them that cause division. Paul called out the false prophets, the false teachers. You ought to look at it and go, let me scrutinize this here real quick and make sure this is right. Because if I give consent, somebody's going to look on that and say, Oh, Pastor Jared liked that. Huh. It must, yeah. yeah, he's changing. That, there must be some truth to that because Pastor Jared liked that. It's a dangerous, saints, when we go about recklessly doing things that we're not being thoughtful of. We have to be considered because every action is scrutinized by those around us, and that's okay for we are living epistles written of God and read of men. Amen. Oh, y'all said we love strong leadership. Oh, thank God for strong leaders. Until I say something, they were like, oh, Lord, I don't know about that. That's a little hard. This church loves truth. There's not a person sitting in this house right now that don't just love the truth. I mean, love it. God, we've given our whole life for it. Many of us have turned away old friends, walked away from even at times families. We've moved away from places and we found something. We found a treasure hidden in a field and we bought this thing. The Bible said, buy the truth and don't sell it. And I'm going to tell you something, saints. I'm not after this for Jared Manning's ego. It'd be a whole lot easier for me just to agree with everybody and be agreeable with everything and then I'd be popular. I've got truth. And this is the only thing taking me into the first resurrection, and I can't miss it. So I don't care if it's for my ego. I don't care if it's to make people feel good about me. I'm not selling out. Not for popularity, not for influence, not for fame, and not for money. I'm not selling this. This is the most precious thing I got in the world. I love my wife, but the word of God is going to get me out of the grave, not my wife. I love my children. Come on, there's a lot of people. There are people right now, preachers, big-time preachers, whose, whose children are doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know what those preachers are doing now? They're going to the congregations and saying, we need to rethink gay marriage. We need to rethink fornication. We need to rethink divorce. We need to rethink. We need to relook at these things because they don't want to see their children damned. I can't save my children. The only way I know that I have done my job to save my children is to tell them the truth. That's the only thing I can do. They'll live and die and they'll stand before God. I can't do anything about that. But I'm not going to change what I preach to fit my children. There are some of my children that are lost right now that if they died right now, they would be lost. And I know they would. But I can't change it so that they'll come in here. I'd rather them come into the kingdom than come in here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'd rather them be offended at me and, and, and sit there and hate my guts but at some point come to repentance. That's all I care about. I just want to see them in the first resurrection. And I'm not going to change it because my children are involved in it. I'm not going to change it because I don't want to see my children lost. And you better be careful in yourself with that mess. All of a sudden your children go into rebellion and start acting crazy. And in your mind you're trying to justify it and make it okay. The devil is a liar. Sin is sin. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Righteousness 
justice exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. It doesn't matter if it's your children or my children. I can't make sin okay so that it makes them happy with me. I got to preach the truth because God's not going to say, well, Jared, did your children, were your children happy with you? Is it, 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 If you're going to get in this kingdom, we got to make sure your kids liked you. He's going to say, did you preach the truth? Did you preach the word? Oh, God. God, I wish these preachers would wake themselves up and come to themselves. Paul didn't look at Timothy and said, oh, Timothy, it's all gravy. Just go to them and talk comfortably to them. He said, take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine that you may be able to save yourself. Wait a minute, I thought Timothy was already saved. How could Timothy not be saved? He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was the bishop of Ephesus. How could Timothy? That you might be able to save yourself and them that hear you. Let's get back to the word of God. All this foolishness out here doesn't mean anything. I'll say this, we'll take up our offering. I was meeting with Xander's school administrator the other day, which was really hilarious, because Xander had no clue I was going to be there. And so a bunch of his friends were like, Xander, what's your dad doing in Mr. Strickland's office? <laughs> and Xander was terrified. <laughs> he walked up, I'm sitting there talking to the school administrator, and I see, I look at the window and I see Xander going. <laughs> I was just there to ask him if he could go to workout during feed. That's all I was there for. Sandra had no clue. And Mr. Strick's like, you really need to play this, man. Play it up. We had a wonderful talk. And he doesn't believe in some of the doctrine I believe in, and that's all right. I'm going to pray the Lord brings him around. But he still believes in righteousness and holiness. And he said, you know, he said, anytime we change things, to be appealing to the world, we're already in rebellion. It's not after we changed it. It is just the desire to change it itself. How can they come out of the power of darkness into the power of God? How can they come out of the world into the church? How can they come out of light and into darkness if where they come is dark. What would provoke them? I'm in this horrible life. So I'm going to come over to your church and I'm going to still be in that life. You're just going to make me okay with it. What would be, what would be the benefit? We don't have to tell them that. We say, hey, child of God, Come here. You don't even know it yet. But you don't have to be there anymore. I don't condemn you. But don't you go sin no more. Well, how can I be made free? Let me tell you about the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the power of the Holy Ghost. And we don't have to sit there and make this stuff up. It's not a fantasy for us. All over this house. I told somebody the other day. They said, man, you know I go to your church and your people, you know, they're really dressed up. They look nice. I said, oh, that's because you're seeing what the Lord has done. It's just Jesus looks good on us. That's it. We just, we just clothed in Jesus. But if you could have seen us before. <laughs> God. And such were. Not are. Such were some of you. Hey, man, don't look at me now and think, well, he must have had it together always. No, it's just that Jesus looks good on me. It's just Jesus has done an amazing work in my life. I don't take any credit for it. Some people say, you're going about to establish your own righteousness. I don't know what righteousness is. What righteousness are you talking about? The only righteous I, righteousness I know is in the word of God, and I can't do that. I found that out a long time ago. I'm completely incapable. I mean, a total failure to try to do it myself. But, oh, now that the Holy, you know, sense of God, that things, I don't cuss no more. And it's not because I'm a good moral person. It's because the Lord took it out my mouth. Come on, somebody. I, I, I haven't drank alcohol in many, many, many years. You want to know why? The Lord just took it right out my mouth. Gave me no taste for it. Come on, somebody. I wasn't kept in church because Jared just thought, man, I can't see myself as a bad guy. I was kept by the power of God. So, no, Jared has done nothing. This is all Jesus. 
And I got about two witnesses in here. Maybe you all think you did it. But for Jared, it's been all Jesus. How many of you, it's been all Jesus? I am what I am by the grace of God. But that grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than them all. I hope this has fed your soul tonight. I hope it's answered some questions. I hope it's given you hope. Saints, the resurrection is the most beautiful thing. God, it's, it's, it's unbelievable hope. Thou will not leave us in the grave. You won't. I'll just wait there until my appointed time. Oh, but when I see Jesus, I hear his voice. I'm going to come forth. Life everlasting. He's eternal. My God, the immortal. All right, we're going to give our tithes and offerings. Praise God. My Lord in heaven. I tell you what, I have felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost tonight. Amen. And my shirt is covered with it. <laughs> That's anointed sweat, guys. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> I'm not trying to discourage you tonight. I just want to encourage you. The truth makes us free. Amen. We got to know what the word of God says. And, and again, I'm not one of those preachers that says, you just take my word for it. Go home. Go in your Bible. Find it. Read it. You'll hear tonight what I said because all I can give you is the word. That's it. Amen. Stand to your feet. Lord, we thank you so much for this time and opportunity and honor we have to be in the house of God. My God, what an anointing tonight. What assistance from the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would cause the words that have come out of my mouth to be grace to the hearer. It would bring hope and comfort to their life. Lord, we are not left desolate or alone. Oh, God, we're going to see you. You're going to come back, Jesus. We're going to behold you. My <laughs> God, behold the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would allow us to just awake to righteousness, God. Father, now as we give to your kingdom, Lord, tithes and offerings, bless those that have to give, bless them abundantly as you watch over your word to perform it concerning them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers, come. Let's give us the Lord. Oh, when I get inside. Oh, when I get inside of the gate. Oh, I'll be happy. Praising my Savior. When I get, when I get inside of the gate. Amen. Praise God. Uh, when I get inside of the gate, glory to God. Um, Brooke and Jonathan's baby shower is this Friday at 630. Family fun night is going to be Friday at 630. And our pastor's appreciation is this October. More details will be later. I um, want to continue to remember my nephew, Braden. God's just continuing to do a great work in him. Keep praying for him. I want to remember uh, Brother Tommy, his family. And what they're going through. May God be with them. May God help them. May God comfort them. And there's nobody in times like this. It's just an unnatural thing to have to bury a child. And in times like this, and there are some of you in here that know what I'm talking about. In times like this, nobody can comfort you but the grace of God. And so let's pray for them. 
abundantly that God would help them, touch them. I want to pray for my grandson Braxton. He's feeling much better, by the way. Uh, he threw up several times today, but then when I got home, he was like, Poppy, go to McDonald's, get me chicken nuggets. And then when I came back and didn't have him, he was like, where's my nuggets? I'm starving. So guess what Poppy did? Yeah, I went and got him nuggets. <laughs> I'd have never done that for my kids. <laughs> Grandkids change you. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what happened to me. Y'all pray for me. I just gotten soft. <laughs> I'd have told them, be quiet, there's stuff in the refrigerator. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm just human. I'll go get you something. <laughs> Kaisha's dog, Bella, her uncle Jeremiah, as he travels. Monique's co-worker battling cancer. Um, I want to pray, uh, and her husband, uh, I want to pray for having a stamp put in. Uh, Danny Jackson, who's Simona's uh, brother, sister Lindy's nephew. I want to pray for him. We want to pray for Viv Carlson, um, Ezekiel Chapman. Ezekiel doing better? Okay, okay, all right. Uh, I know Alex and Lydia are doing much better, so we're thankful for that. They weren't doing too bad when I went over there, man. They were wild up. We want to pray for Lucas, who is a friend of S Sister Celeste, April and Jacob, who is Sister Betty's daughter and grandson. We also want to remember uh, Sister Betty and Brother Joe. They're traveling this weekend. We want to remember Brother Daniel. Uh, he was like, Pastor, I'm, I've not left the church. I have to go to Florida. He's he's uh, he's part of a plumbing outfit out of Florida. And so he's like, I'm going to be there for two weeks for uh, doing work. He said, so I haven't left. I'll, I'll see you when I get back. So pray for him as he travels. Um, Sister Leslie on a job. Want to continue? God's got the right job. Amen. I, what I'm praying is, is her Internet business will just explode. Amen. She'll become the next owner of Amazon or something, you know. We'll have a Jeff Bezos back there. Hallelujah. She'll build me an aircraft and we'll fly to the moon. Glory to God. <laughs> we want to pray for Sister Hannah. Uh, continued recovery. Brother Calvin, want to remember him. Brother Calvin really needs our prayers. Got to touch his body. Emma Horton, uh, who is Sister Laverne's friend. I uh, want to pray for Sister Monique. Upcoming procedures and tests. Um, and, of course, Sister Mary Lou and her family. Um, man, I was so thankful that God brought this family in, got to meet Big Al and got to talk with him, spend time with him, got to pray with him. Uh, he couldn't say a lot because of his stroke, but he really didn't need to. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm glad that you all did. I'm glad. What, you know, it's such an honor. It really is. People will never know. Uh, knowing that God allowed me to minister to that man until he passed. Wow. I, I just, I feel so unworthy at times of all the people of God that I've been able to pastor and shepherd. It's just been, it's been phenomenal. And so we want to pray for them and as they travel to North Carolina. And my intention is I'll be there Friday. So um, we'll be there. Um, we want to pray for Sister Jody and her daughter. We want to pray for Sister Rindy and Brother Walt Johnson. I haven't been able to get a hold of Sister Rindy, Sister Cheryl. Okay. We just want to pray. God will touch and help. Um, we want to remember Brother David Peters and our prayers that whatever God's will would be done and that God would comfort him in this time. Uh, really, two great leaders within that apostolic organization, uh, Brother Denny Livingston. Uh, he's also got cancer. He's been battling it for a few years now. I just want to pray for these men. They, they influence a lot of people. Um, and even though I don't agree with some of the stuff they have taught, they have kept the name of Jesus' baptism and the Holy Ghost and the blood of Jesus, preaching it and pounding it all over the world. And uh, Bishop Peters was a wonderful man. Oh, first time I ever met him. He didn't know who I was from Adam. I walked in there with Brother Williams, and he set me right on his platform, and I thought, this guy don't know me, but he was so gracious and kind. And from that point on, great man, influence over thousands of people around the world. Every, if we'd see each other in a restaurant in a store, he would make his way over. I wouldn't even see him. He'd come over and greet me and say hi to me. That's the kind of people these folks are. I want to pray for them that God would help them and strengthen them.
Anything else, saints? Oh, yes, Brother Jimmy is going to get on a jet plane, but you better come back again. <laughs> hey, man, we won't have no John Denver story around here. <laughs> you better come back again. So we want to pray that God would cover him, grant him journey mercies on his way and coming back. Anything else? Whew, I preached a long time tonight, saints. That was God all the way. Father, we thank you so much. Oh, Lord, your word is so awesome. What would we do without it, Lord? I don't even want to imagine it. I thank you that you didn't leave us ignorant, God, but you left us your word that we might be able, oh, God, to speak those things of truth, God, and hope and strength, God, to your people, to give them some joy in their hearts and some life in their spirit, God. Father, help us to come on back, Lord. We want to come back to you, Lord, and awake to righteousness that we sin not. Father, we have so many requests that we pray for, but, Lord, specifically, I pray for Brother Tommy Parrish, God, and I pray for that family. Lord, what devastation and what hardship, God, has befallen them at this time, even, Lord, since the passing of Sister Kim, God. My God, bring comfort to them. Bring strength to them. Lord, let hope come alive in their hearts, Lord God. Lord, as they remember you as the great comfort of their life, my God, let your presence surround them as they depend upon you, Lord. Meet every one of their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I pray for Sister Mary Lou, God, and Dakota. I pray for Alan, the rest of the family, God. My God, be with them. Keep them, Lord. God, encourage them. Comfort them, God. Meet their needs, oh God, financially, physically, oh God. Lord, keep Sister Mary Lou encouraged. Keep her in good health. And let her prosper as her soul prospers, Lord. We believe you to do an exceeding work. I pray for all of those saints that are traveling, God, who are going on journeys to whatever destination they're headed, that you would keep them safe as they leave this place, Lord, and bring them back, O oh God. Lord, and for all of these things, we will give unto you alone the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. Shake somebody's hand and tell them, saints, we got hope. We got hope.